The first Formula 1 preseason test of the season just wrapped up at Barcelona, and after three full days of running, there are a lot of things that we can learn from the start of Formula 1's brand new era. Let's check them out! Ok, so let's begin by talking about my notes from each of the three testing days and then let's take a look at the overall results of the testing. So for the first day, and I'm going to be reading a few notes, I've got here that we have had no red flags and that most of the cars were reliable. Now the Alfa Romeo and the Haas seem to have trouble and those were the exceptions to the, to the reliable cars that I was talking about, as they did very very few laps, but we will actually analyze this later. Now this was also the day where we got to see the full Red Bull racing car, so I've got an analysis video linked right here here, but the, this was the first time that we got to see the full Red Bull Racing and not only the livery reveal, and we also got to see the brand new Haas, so if you remember during car launch season, Haas was the first team to launch their car, but we only saw a pretty basic version of their car and it, was, it honestly looked a bit weird. So for the first day of preseason testing we finally got to see the real VF22 in all of its glory and it was a very very interesting car and I will have a video on the full VF22 next week, so stay tuned for that, but definitely a very interesting car and we got to see the full new Haas. And we also got a comment from Lando Norris regarding the car's behavior, saying that the weight makes a massive difference for just the driving, how the car reacts. It's a lot heavier than it was last season, so it just feels a bit slower, a bit more sluggish. And Lando Norris also described the car as feeling like it was on a full tank of fuel on a quality run, which was very very interesting, and we got to see that these comments were actually related to the low speed corners, because as you'll see throughout this video, these cars are much faster during the high speed corners, but during the low speed corners they seem to be a bit slower. So in day 2 we got to see Mercedes and Red Bull actually showing up with some cooling louvers, so cooling louvers are a new way of cooling the car, that's now allowed for 2022, but in both of their show cars there weren't any cooling louvers, so they are probably trying this setup out for in order for in some tracks that require extra cooling, just like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia or Mexico, where they have this package ready if they need extra engine cooling, so this will be uh, very interesting to watch at which tracks they need the cooling louvers because their show cars didn't have them. And this was also one of the first days where we got to see cars running aero rakes. So if you take a look at this picture right here of Carlos Sainz Ferrari, you can see this weird structure right here uh, behind the front tire. Now this is what is called an aero rake. And teams are actually using aero rakes in order to study the airflow fields of the car and then compare them with their simulations and with the wind tunnel. So in the aero rake you see that there are a lot of dots right here as you can see in this picture and each of these dots is actually used to measure something. So in most cases they are used to measure pressure because it's really really interesting to get the pressure distribution of each of these cars and but they can also be used to measure velocity of the air. And then they can map it out because they know exactly where each of the measurement points are, so here, 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 etc. And then they can relate this data with the data that they get from CFD or from the wind tunnel testing. And this is why you hear that teams are doing a, a few flyby laps at a constant speed because they really need the data to be at a real constant speed in order to make sense with the wind tunnel simulations. So what they will do is that they will put this error rake and then they will do a normal lap but then on the main straight they will fix a velocity on the dashboard in order to get a, a, a very good reading from these uh, error rakes. So this is one of the most interesting things about preseason testing is seeing the teams trying to correlate their data from the wind tunnel and from CFD with the real car on the track and if the correlation works out and if the results from the track match the ones from the wind tunnel and from the CFD, well then the team has a very very good platform to develop updates throughout the season. So it was in the second day of testing that we saw the first two red flags of the session with Perez having a gearbox issue in the morning and Mazepin having a fuel pump issue in the afternoon and these were the first real reliability issues that we have seen in the 2022 cars but don't worry there's a lot more to come. And then in day 3 we had the first teams actually dropping out of testing. So the first car to actually crash was Pierre Gasly in his Alfa Tauri who actually went up against the wall and broke his front wing and his front suspension, but Alfa Tauri actually managed to get the car running before the day's end, so very good job from the Alfa Tauri mechanics there. But then we, ha we had issues with the Aston Martin, so I think it was an oil leak that happened in Sebastian Vettel's Aston Martin, which cut their session short and then they weren't, they weren't able to get back on track, but this was the only real reliability issue in a Mercedes powered car. Then we also had various issues for Haas which had issues with their pumping so both in the oil pumping and in 
the fuel pumping, which caused reliability issues throughout most of the days. And of course, you can see it in the Haas that they lost their Russian livery right here. So given everything that's going on in the world, Haas had to drop their Euralkali sponsorship. So let's see what happens to the team going further. And then we also had the major reliability issues of Alpine. So Alpine were not looking fast through the preseason test, but then on the third day that also culminated in their car actually catching fire. And you can see a picture of here Alonso thinking about Alpine and how it's probably not going to work out this season, but their car was on fire and it was the first real reliability issue that we saw where a car actually got on fire because the fire on the Aston Martin which was pretty much controlled and the extent of damage that this fire caused meant that Alpine could not get the car out for testing again so their testing was also cut short. So the testing for these four teams was cut short but I also need to speak about Alfa Romeo Racing because due to the purposing issues that they were having their session was pretty much cut short as well because of gearbox issues. So if you watched my video yesterday about I will have it linked right here. You'll know that Alfa Romeo's back of the car was actually hitting the track and this was causing various levels of gearbox damage. So they hope to have a, a solution ready for Bahrain testing and we really need to take a look at these purposing issues with more attention because it seems to be affecting all of the teams but in the case of Alfa Romeo it seems to be causing them real damage to the gearbox so this is something that we need to take a look at. Okay so now let's actually take a look at the reliability of each of the teams and which drivers actually made more laps. So so I've got a chart here with the total laps by each team and you saw that just like as per usual Mercedes did a lot of laps and if they are not number one they are usually number two so everything is as per usual with Mercedes. Now Ferrari did the most laps which is really really encouraging because their car looked quick and had some of the quickest times that we've seen on the board for each of the three days but they managed to do a lot a lot of laps more than any other team and this means that they probably could get their entire preseason testing program done and that once they reach Bahrain they can be in a more relaxed state and this also means that their car was very very reliable. Now then again we have Mercedes and McLaren with the Mercedes power unit so Mercedes power unit is probably a very very reliable power unit since both of these teams could do a very big number of laps and it's honestly very very good to see and a very encouraging sign for McLaren for them to be here in the third place because McLaren is historically a team that with the Renault and Honda days had a few issues in preseason testing so very very good to see them here and McLaren is also one of the teams that seems to have their purposing issues very much under control because they have a very very interesting floor design that seems to control purposing better than any other team. Well then we have current drivers champions Red Bull Racing here in third in fourth place and then we have Williams and honestly any of these teams so Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, Red Bull and Williams these don't worry me because because all of them were in this range of the 350 plus laps so this shows very very good reliability so for me there's no signs to worry for these teams of course I need to say that Ferrari were the standouts but then coming into the bottom five teams there are a lot of things that I begin to get worried so AlphaTauri, Aston Martin and Alpine did around the same number of laps but their preseason tests were a little bit rough so as you saw before Gasly had the crash, Aston Martin had that oil leak and Alpine's car actually caught on fire. So all of these teams have different issues to solve so in the case of AlphaTauri their drivers need to get a better grip on the car in order to crash less and in the case of Aston Martin and Alpine they really really need to get their reliability underway because you start to see that teams like Alpine did almost half of the laps as Ferrari so it's really a, a worrying sign for Alpine and given that they are the only team on the grid to run the Rhino power unit they really really need to be careful with these reliability issues because they have got they haven't got other teams to compare to they only need to do their own thing and this is a very very worrying sign for a manufacturer team and then we have the two teams by far that worry me the most so Alfa Romeo and Haas so Alfa Romeo once again was having their poor purposing issues and Haas was having various various leaks but of course that the preseason test for Haas is being a little more, more rough than for other teams so we have got to excuse them a little bit given the everything that's happening to the team but it's very interesting to see that both of the teams that are having issues 
are using the same power unit that actually did the most laps. So very, very interesting to see. And what this tells me is that probably they are having issues fitting the Ferrari power unit to their chassis because Ferrari actually designs the whole thing for themselves so they can integrate it very tightly into their package and they probably know everything that's going on inside of the power unit whereas Alfa Romeo and Haas don't seem to have such a good grip on the Ferrari power unit. Now this is very interesting because historically Alfa Romeo and Haas have always had the worst precision sessions of any team and it will be very interesting to see if they can turn this around come bar and testing because with this with such a low number of laps they aren't gathering any relevant data on the car and as you will see in my next graph it's really really worrying for some drivers now this is especially worrying because it's a new generation of cars that drivers don't know how to drive so every single uh, minute of experience is very very precious and with such a low number of laps this really worries me Okay, but now let's actually take a look at the number of laps for each driver. So we have Carlos Sainz leading the charge and then we have drivers from the top, from those top five teams around this section right here. So anywhere from the laps that Sainz did to around where Vettel did doesn't worry me at all because if you manage to do more than 150 to 170 laps, then you have done more than two or three Grand Prix distances around Barcelona. So this doesn't really worry me at all. So we have here, so cars from Ferrari, McLaren, Mercedes, Williams, Red Bull, Ferrari, Alfa Tauri, and Mercedes again. So this means that these drivers actually managed to get a lot of experience. And for me, the outlier here is pretty much Lando Norris and Sergio Perez, which even though they had one of the cars that managed to do the most laps, they were on the bottom part of the chart right here so I think that this is a pretty bad sign for them given that their teammates managed to do way way more laps than them but as I said anywhere from the 150 up range means that the drivers are probably good and probably have a very very good grip on the car especially those drivers that got to drive during the afternoon of day 3 where they actually put artificial water on the track which meant that drivers got to experience these cars in wet weather running for the first time but what really worries me is in this section right here. So going from Zhou Guan Yu to Schumacher, Mazepin, Bottas and of course Kubica, but Kubica doesn't really matter for this comparison. These drivers got to do very, very few laps and especially in the case of drivers just like Valtteri Bottas who are changing teams, it's really, really bad for them to drive such a low number of laps and also for Nikita Mazepin and for Mick Schumacher who were always at the back last year so didn't gain that much of an experience it's really bad to see them with such a low number of laps and especially when you compare the number of laps that Bottas did to what Sainz did Bottas didn't even complete a full Grand Prix distance so he was the only driver not to compete not to complete a full Grand Prix distance and he's changing teams he needs to get used to the Ferrari power unit so not a really good sign for all for Romeo and I've also got a very interesting chart right here, which is the total adjusted number of laps for each power unit manufacturer. So you know that every single power unit manufacturer, with the exception of Renault, has got more than one team. So what I did for Ferrari, Red Bull and Mercedes was that I summed up every single number of laps from all of their teams and then divided by the number of teams. So Mercedes has four teams, so in average each of the teams managed to do 350 laps. So this is a very, very good sign for the Mercedes power teams. And and if you see in this chart right here, you see that Mercedes, McLaren, Williams and Aston Martin are all pretty much near the top. So they managed to do an average of 350 laps, which is very, very good. Now, Red Bull with Red Bull and Alpha Tauri weren't far behind. And I'm not putting Honda here because they are now officially called Red Bull powertrains. But... Red Bull is here, so they are in number two. Of course, that they have got less teams, so this is a little bit less representative. But nonetheless, they have they showed very, very good reliability. When it came to Alpine and Ferrari, they were pretty much around the same level. But you know that Alpine only has that one team. And it's pretty worrying to see that Alpine as a manufacturer team is actually below the average of the Red Bull and Mercedes power teams, which includes our main competition in Aston Martin, in teams like McLaren, in teams like AlphaTauri. So they are way below their main competition. So this is a pretty worrying sign for Alpine. And then once again, when it comes to Ferrari, we are seeing some very weird results. So in average, they seem to be the less reliable power unit. But then when you check this lap chart, you see that Ferrari is actually number one of the lap times. So once again, this really indicates to me that Ferrari itself has 
got some very, very good reliability, but then their customer teams don't really have that good reliability for different various issues. So they don't seem to be able to fit the Ferrari power unit as well as some other teams because most of their reliability issues were actually related to the power unit and not to their car or in aspects like the suspension or the aerodynamics. So very, very interesting to see that Ferrari's average reliability was here around the 250 lap mark. But then if you take a look at their laps, they did 439 laps and their customer teams did very, very few laps. So what this really indicates to me is once again that their customer teams are really suffering. So this is something that Ferrari really needs to investigate, where, whether it's the fault of their power unit and they just got lucky in testing, or whether their customer teams are doing something wrong. Okay, and I've got here just a few closing remarks. So the fastest time of testing was from Lewis Hamilton, a 119.138. And for context, the fastest time last year for the Spanish Grand Prix for, for the pole position was a 116.741. And the fastest time during the race, the fastest lap was a 118.149. Now, these times are very, very close to the times we are seeing now in precision testing. And honestly, I expect all the cars in precision testing not to be running in qualifying trim and to be running uh, with a lot of fuel. So they are probably not showing their full performance. And this goes basically in line with what I expected, which is once these cars get into full performance mode with all of the engine modes and everything, I expect them to be about one to one and a half seconds slower than last year's cars, which means that by 2023 or 2024, we should expect the lap times to be about the same as the downforce monsters of 2021 and 2020. Now, the main difference in these cars is that they are very, very stable in the high speed corners due to the way they produce downforce, but in the low speed corners, they are way more sluggish than the old cars because the Venturi tunnels work much, much better in high speed situations. So for those low speed corners, the cars will be much, much worse. Now, when it comes to the cars following each other, this is something that we saw a lot of drivers try to do during the testing. So they were trying to follow their, their rivals closely in order to test out what the car performance difference is to last year when following closely. And I've got a quote here from Charles Leclerc, who said that the cars were much better to follow the car in front between three and one second. So in that critical window where dirty air was very bad, then from one second to about half a second behind the, the following car, the cars perform about the same as last year, but that between half a second and being glued to the gearbox of the car in front, these cars are much, much better to follow. So this means that the regulations are working and that the cars are still able to produce downforce when they are close to the car in front. And this coupled with DRS means that we are going to see a lot of overtakes in this generation of cars, which I think that is a very, very good sign. Now, when it comes to the pecking order, it's still too early to call, but there are four teams that really stood out to me. So those four teams are Ferrari, Mercedes, Red Bull and McLaren. And these teams really stood out to me because they have four different aerodynamic concepts, but all of their cars seem to be very, very reliable. And they also seem to be posting consistently very good lap times and the tire wear didn't seem to be a concern. Now, when it comes to my highlights of the test, I must say that it's McLaren and Ferrari because McLaren is the first team to, to have a solution for the porpoising problem so they seem to have that under control and Ferrari seem to have a very very fast car that is also very reliable by far the most reliable car out of every single car we saw in the testing so those are my teams to watch for the 2022 season McLaren and Ferrari seem to be performing very very well so that's been it for my analysis of the first Formula 1 preseason test at Barcelona this year we definitely learned a lot of things about this generation of cars coming to which teams are the best to the porpoising problem and I'm very excited to see the kinds of solution that teams finds these problems come Bahrain time and that test will thankfully be broadcast in Formula 1 TV Pro and in other pay-per-view channels so we will be able to watch that test full on with full commentary which will be very very nice because it really pained me not to be able to watch the Barcelona tests. So that's been it for this video and I really hope you guys enjoyed and if you did I have a playlist right here with all of my analysis of every single Formula 1 2022 car and I will also have an updated video on the Haas coming soon. But in the meantime that's been it for this video really hope you guys enjoyed and if you did, please don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you next week for more videos. Goodbye!